Okay, so Trini's not going to be here tonight, so so I will run the meeting and I'll call the meeting of the select board um, to order at 5.32 p.m. And the first order of business is uh, public comment. So if there are members of the public here, this comment that is not already on the agenda, now is the time for you to speak. Yes, Tamara. I'm just here to update um, for the library um, that our fundraising letter is going out in the next couple of weeks and our 2022 budget, um, a draft has been submitted and we're working on that. Um, that a no, new logo and website are coming by the end of the year. Very excited about that. Um, we're gonna have recorded story times so people don't have to gather um, two for kids and one for adults about how to read to their kids. Um, and currently there's curbside six days a week and public in the building Mondays and Thursdays, 50 minutes for browsing and 45 minutes for computer use. And then you can always contact people for drop off and um, exchanges of, of materials at the door. Uh, I have uh, one thing. I, I'm, I'm here on behalf of the East Valley Community Group and the, and the committee. And um, I'm, uh, Trini suggested that there would be a discussion and vote on the idea of releasing the RFP. Uh, and so that's what I'm here to see about. I didn't really see anything on the agenda, although Trini said it was there. Uh, Mark, it's uh, under new business. It's the second item request for proposals. East Randolph Hall Architect Services. Great, thank you. Is there anyone else? What is Mark's last name, please? That's Mark Kelly. Kelly, K-E-L-L-E-Y. Okay. <clears throat> So we'll move on to approval of the agenda. If, if I may ask the board to consider a, a change, um, I inadvertently excluded one item from the agenda that the board had reviewed last uh, month, which was the uh, draft purchasing policy change. Uh, the board had asked for changes and had asked to have the item back on the agenda this, this meeting and inadvertently left it off. But um, if there was one change to be made uh, and it could be considered, we'd like to add it under old business. Sounds good to me. Thank you. Tom, were you trying to say something there? You're, yeah, you're muted. I said that <clears throat> um, I would move the approval of the agenda with the um, uh, addition that Adolfo just stipulated. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 3-0. We'll move on to the consent calendar. Make a motion to approve the consent calendar. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 3-0. Move on to new business. Um, starting out with the Branchwood Lot Environmental Assessment. Uh, yes, this is one item that um, um, is a partnership between the town and Tour Rosado Quichi. Um, we have been working closely with um, uh, Sarah Wright, who's on this call, as well as with Josh Jerome, who's on staff. Uh, it is in relation to the phase one environmental assessment of the Branchwood lot and um, um, I'd like to ask and invite Sarah and Kevin to speak more about this to the board, please. So, uh, ready? Here we go. Yes, please. Okay, so I'm going to lead off and then we're going to go over to Sarah and then come back to me a little bit. Can you all hear me okay? Yep, loud and clear. Yep. Wonderful. Uh, so just to give you a very brief recap of Brownfields in general and what we're doing on that particular site, 
Uh, the Branchwood site, as you know, is on the kind of eastern edge of the village. It's the next to the railroad track has the big brick smokestack in it. Um, and it is mostly along the railroad track, and then there's one little section on the other side of the street, uh, but it's pretty flat, uh, vacant site right now, with the exception of the smokestack. So we have done a phase one environmental assessment, which Sarah is going to talk about in a second, and that is just an overview look at the site and its past history and what its current condition is. It uh, does not involve any testing. What we're about to do is based upon the phase one, do a phase two. Uh, the phase two is a thorough testing of the site, um, including boring for groundwater all the way up to surficial stuff uh, going on there. It is bounded by the phase one and that the phase one basically says, these are the things um, that might be there. There are no known uh, releases of product on the site, but there may be stuff there. That's why we're looking and um, but you only look for certain things in certain places and that's basically the phase one points you in that direction. And that's what we're about to do. Then after uh, the phase two, typically, if there are things that need to be cleaned up, um, then one does a corrective action plan and that lays out what would need to be done and how much it would cost. And then that's where we would stop. Uh, we don't have any funding for any actual cleanup if actual cleanup is needed. Um, a lot of times cleanup is not done, even though there are materials there, you just leave it alone or you put a notice to the records or that type of thing. Um, and we also are hoping to do what we call an area-wide planning study for this particular parcel, which is really uh, a little bit of a, of a what, what might go there. Uh, and so we would try to bring in some uh, expertise from our consultants who would look at actual redevelopment possibilities and sketchups for the site as you try to drive redevelopment, which is of course the whole purpose of the project is to redevelop that site. And so Sarah's gonna talk about uh, the details a little bit of what we've done and what we plan to do. Thank you everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much for having us this evening. It's, it's a pleasure to speak with you all. Um, so just to review a little bit about the work that has already come before this point. Um, so we, we've done a phase one, which as Kevin mentioned, doesn't actually involve doing any chemical testing on the ground. Um, it really is focused around records review and speaking with um, local members of staff, local community members who are familiar with the site's history um, and, and identifying what might be um, some potential areas that should be tested, some potential contaminants that might be found on the site, given the site's history and its, its past uses and current uses as well. Um, and so that phase one was um, completed just recently. Um, we have, we, I believe that the, uh, the actual document's been shared with Josh and, and um, others so that that should be available to you for your review. Um, it was finished in August and it sort of lays out a number of what we call recognized environmental conditions, which is effectively um, the, the maybes of what might be on the site. And that sort of is the roadmap for what will eventually be tested in phase two. And so the, the conditions that were, the potential conditions that were identified are really very closely tied to what we already know about the, the history of the site. We know that there was a fire on site and whenever you have combustion materials that can lead to um, deposition of contaminants or perhaps there, were, uh, there was material that was stored on site that ended up being um, either sort of burned or uh, sort of stirred into the soil as a result of the destruction of the property. We know too that you know, this site has a very long and rich history in the community of um, having been a wood products manufacturing facility. So we know that there were a number of chemicals that were used and stored on sites, adhesives and glues and um, some, some wood stains, that sort of stuff. Um, so that's something that you know, we need to take into consideration when we think about future testing. We also know that the, the former manufacturing facility had um, a boiler on site. Obviously, there's you can still see the smokestack on site. So they were burning coal and wood and waste. Um, and that included some of the chemicals that were used on the wood products um, within the 
within the facility. And so there was presumably some atmospheric deposition from, from that boiler activity. We know that coal was stored on site and sometimes there can be chemicals that um, result from sort of leaching out of that, that storage pile. We know too, of course, that the railroad was right nearby. And so there's some potential contaminants that might've resulted from railroad activity um, or from the, the railroad ties themselves that were located there. We know that the town has been um, using the site since it was acquired um, in, in various ways. And there's been some vehicles parked on it. Um, there, there's been some piling of, of soil and other materials. Also snow has been um, sort of stored on site. And so there, there are a number of contaminants that might have um, sort of come into play as a result of those activities there when the site visit was done there's sort of one site visit that was conducted as part of the phase one just sort of a visual assessment of the site um it was observed that there was some staining of the ground um so there there may have been some sort of contaminant that was released um on the surface and we we don't obviously know anything more about that but that's something that's been flagged for further um investigation it's a pretty small area that, that we're seeing some staining there um, and then there's also the potential for contamination from nearby properties. We do know that um, there are a couple of former, uh, former underground storage, oil storage tanks and gasoline storage tanks um, that were located at the, uh, the smart stop and then also um, another, another facility nearby. And we have documented releases from those underground storage tanks. So it's possible that some contamination might be migrating on groundwater toward, uh, toward the site itself. So that's something that we keep in mind and we, we take a look at. Um, and so to date, we've, we've spent, uh, we spent about uh, $5,500 on the phase one. Um, and this is thanks to the, the, uh, the generosity of EPA who, who granted um, our region through Two Rivers a grant of for assessment funding to help communities to, to revitalize these sites. Um, so we've invested about 5,500 for the phase one. We've also committed another $4,000 to, to make a sampling plan for the phase two. And the, at the moment, the ballpark estimate we have for what that phase two study is actually gonna cost is gonna be an additional probably $40,000. As Kevin mentioned as well, um, this site is an excellent candidate for doing an area-wide study, which really can help um, let catalyze redevelopment and revitalization in the area. And that would be about another $9,000 too, we're figuring. If the phase two comes back and says that some contamination was found as a result of um, the various activities that we discussed earlier through the phase one, then there might be additional assessment costs that um, would be required. And that would be something that would uh, be determined in conversation with uh, both DEC and EPA, which keep very close, um, very close tabs on, on all assessment processes. Um, and so I guess moving forward, something important to note for the town is that we are in a place now where moving forward with the phase two would require um, sort of very careful um, understanding of where, how things are distributed on the site and making sure that that um, doesn't change before we can actually get out there and, and sample it so it doesn't actually you know, confuse the data that we end up taking. So it's going to be important that um, you know the the site's currently you know used for snow remove snow storage and and um, dumping and that sort of thing and that's perfectly fine. But any more intensive use of the site where you're uh, you know you're moving earth or um, uh, you know doing parking equipment that's going to be you know leaking leaking materials onto the ground that is gonna change the, the sort of testing needs for the site. And so we would ask that the town uh, be very careful about not, not causing too many um, of those activities on the site and really just sticking to snow removal until we can get that testing done, uh, which we anticipate would probably be uh, winter or spring that really needs to have, uh, we need to not have snow cover on the site when, when the testing is being done, um, if at all possible. So. We're in this place now where it's not likely that we're going to get regulatory approval to start testing before the snow flies. Um, and so it's, it's probable that we're, we're looking out till early spring um, when, when, when the soils finally thaw a little bit and we can get out there with a the drill rig. Kevin, ask back to you. Thanks. Uh, so we have uh, the plan 
which we're going to go over with EPA and uh, the state uh, next week, just to make sure they're all on board because they, they both do the sign off on the testing uh, is three uh, groundwater wells, about 90 surface soil grabs. So we basically grid out the site. Uh, we've divided the site into four areas, I believe, Sarah, right? Three or four, four, is it four? Four areas. And so we can uh, kind of uh, basically we take a bunch of samples and we characterize each area because each area might be a little different. Um, and then they check through all the analysis on that and get us back some information. The the biggest thing that I want to make sure everybody understands, and, and in our previous conversations with Adolfo, it was really good, um, is that this basically is a process that any redevelopment would go forward through. Anybody touching this site uh, is going to say, I need a phase one. And phase one comes back and says, there are issues there, maybe. And they're going to say, well, let's find out what those issues are and do a phase two. And so in this case, uh, you know, we're bringing the money to do that. There is the possibility, of course, that we find something on the site. Phase two can do that. And that that creates a requirement to clean it up. Because right now you don't have a known release on the site, um, but you haven't done any investigation, actually. And uh, should there be a known release, and then there may be something that needs to get cleaned up. Right now, the most of the concerns we have on the site we think are surficial. So most of our testing is going to be in the top uh, foot and a half of soil out there. And um, what we generally see from burned places and stuff is that surficial contamination. And the main issue isn't that it's going to go into the water and pollute elsewhere. It's really that, that you touch it and you do that type of thing. And so a lot of those contaminants can simply put, be put under buildings or under parking lots and be dealt with that way and not even moved off of site. But that would be uh, you know, what we need to figure out in the going forward part of life through that corrective action planning. But right now, we just wanted to check in. We always do um, with owners and make sure like, okay, we're going to okay our people to go do testing. And once they do testing, then we're going to get a result. And, and of course, uh, we don't know exactly what that be, will be because that's why we're doing the testing. Um, oh, Sarah mentioned the adjacent stuff. Yeah, I did. Uh, I, I went up there today just to re-familiarize myself with the site. Uh, you have a couple of large pieces of welded rail on the site and a few new, uh, brand new uh, railroad ties. Yeah, you, you don't want to be bringing in new soil material because, again, we're going to take a detailed snapshot at a certain point in time. And any change in the site, except the usual stuff like the snow dump, will require a new detailed snapshot and we don't have unending amounts of funds there to do that. So any questions or comments or concerns? Oh, uh, yes, Kevin, actually, I do. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Wonder, Kevin, were you gonna mention Brella? Um, I, I wasn't gonna, but Brella is a good idea. Uh, you already own the site, uh, but but you can go into Brella. Brella is the state's program. And it essentially, it does a couple of things. It, um, it has a slightly higher level of review, I would say. And when you come out of it, you get something called a certificate of completion. Basically, there are two um, end products from Brownfield sites. Uh, one is a SMAC letter, is what we call it, the Sites Management Activity Completion Letter which is you've done everything you need to do, you're fine for now. Um, it's better to go through Brella and to get the certificate of completion, which is you've done everything we need you to do now and forever more letter. Um, the, I don't know if the town intends to keep owning the site or if it intends to transfer the site potentially to a private owner, um, but the certificate of completion transfers to other people. So, they're, they get as good as protection as, as you get. And so it's good to go through that process. Uh, so somebody had a question. I don't know who that was. Yes, I do. Oh. Hi. Um, Hi. Yeah, I'm the administrative assistant for the town. About a month ago, I reached out to, through an email chain, through various people to the railroad company uh, regarding those tracks and the ties and all of the junk that's on that property they never confirmed that they were going to come get it but do you want me to make sure that they don't do you want me to leave that site the way it is 
Um, if they want to come and take the rails, that's perfectly fine. Uh, okay. There are probably, I would say, six or seven brand new railroad ties on the site. Um, they can either leave them or they can take them, um, but they shouldn't just like move them around willy nilly or bring some more stuff. Um, you also have some non-town industrial equipment on the site. I don't know why they're there, if they just park there regularly or whatnot, but in general, that's not the best idea. Once we kind of get going, you can't secure the site. There's no fence or whatever, but you, you, know, you don't want people just parking there or potentially depositing things on the site. Thank you very much. Adolfo, would it make sense to let the sheriff know and ask them to sort of discourage folks from parking there for long stretches with heavy equipment? Uh, we, we can, we can implement, really the only thing that they can do is, is ticket or tow. So, um, you know, if we post, you know, private property, no parking or, you know, could be towed, then then we can do that, but it makes it more complicated if it's a, like a big rig or, or something else. So, but, um, but yes, I can coordinate with the sheriff's department. So the past activities have been happening there have that basically has been the boneyard for a number of construction projects that have been going on around town. Mm -hmm. And so along with that, there's also been, a, I think there's one or two folks that may drive tractor trailer that have been using that as a parking spot for their truck over the weekend so, um, you know, I'd hate to be ticketing somebody for that. So I don't know if we're able to figure out who that is, but maybe we can just uh, nicely tell them that maybe that's not acceptable at this point and they need to find another place to, uh, to park. Yeah, we typically, the Sheriff's Department does what it can to reach uh, folk if, they, if they're parked illegally or, you know, in our case, in the wintertime, they're parked in the road. The challenge is, that the sheriff's department will go off of information that's registered with the DMV. And we find that um, sometimes people don't give their telephone number to the DMV and we're unable to reach them. So, um, but yeah, we could, you know, we, we could work with them to say, you know, the first time that someone is there, it could be a warning instead of a ticket of, you know, don't park here anymore, you're gonna get towed. Uh, and then the second time the same vehicle is, is ticketed, it could be a, either a ticket or a tow but after a warning. Well, I'm only saying that because I don't want to see us get into a situation like we were getting into last winter with parking vans and we don't need to be getting involved in towing a tractor trailer truck, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. Kevin, Kevin, this is Pat French. Can you hear me? Yes, Pat, I can. Thank you. Sorry, I was having trouble getting into the meeting. So I missed the first part. Did you say Two Rivers has the money to pay for the level two? Yes. So we've spent about five and a half thousand. As Sarah said, we anticipate spending another 40,000 on testing is what our scope is coming back at right now. Um, and then maybe another nine or 10,000 in site planning around what might go there in the future. That gives us a little wiggle room should we find um, you know, a surprise out there in terms of an additional test. But, um, but that's pretty pretty conservative. And we'll know more after next week. We essentially have to get the EPA and DEC to approve the testing plan. And if we did find something serious, would we be able to get help to clean that up? Uh, we don't have any funds to do that. The state uh, has a limited pot of its money to do that. And since you're a town, you are potentially available to get grants to do that, whereas a private entity would be getting a loan to do that. And again, as I said, a lot of what we would expect to find on the site um, typically just gets covered uh, through redevelopment. And so that might drive redevelopment plans and then in terms of like, it's better to put the parking lot over here versus over there. But putting parking lots on a site contaminate them directly uh, so kind of a weird chicken and egg thing any other questions thank you i have a question i'm a community member though i'm not a select board member can i this is hannah arias can i ask a question um sure hannah is it, is it brief y yes i yeah but i hope so okay um, 
what sort of communication goes out to uh, the community that lives either adjacent or very nearby a, a property when there are plans? How does that work? Uh, when when there are plans to redevelop a site? Yes. Uh, well, I would imagine you know redeveloping that site is going to involve a great big deal of of community stuff in the area wide planning process. Um, there is a lot of public outreach to try to to kind of do what we call a charrette and think about what might go on there. And then they actually do some um, sketch ups of what might go there. So whether it's, you know, is it residential, is it industrial, is it commercial residential mixed up, um, all that type of thing. There's outreach on that. During just the straight old testing brownfield side, um, we just communicate with the town directly on those things. Got it, thank you. Thanks, Hannah. That's a good question. You you live not far from there, and that's perfectly reasonable for you to want to know what's going on. Yeah, very interested. I'm following. But anything that happened there is going to go through a complete, you know, zoning process, development review process. So you know, there'll be plenty of opportunity to weigh in on anything that occurs there. I'm really happy to hear that. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that comment, Perry. Other questions? Just just a comment, I would assume that the level two investigation would also be open to the public so that they can find out what, what is there too. Correct, the um, phase two documents, once they're done are public documents and the town will have a copy, They'll, it'll be a thick copy. Most of the important stuff like in the phase one you have is really in the first 20 pages or so and then there's like 400 pages extra there, but just read the front. All right. All right, well, if, if there are no other questions or comments, um, we'll thank uh, Kevin and Sarah for joining us and providing this very helpful information. Thank you. Great. Thanks. And so um, we'll move on to uh, request for proposals for the East Randolph Hall um, Architect Services. So the East uh, Valley Community Group had been working with Trini to create a draft of the um, of a potential um, RFP or RFD for the receiving of bids for an architect services. Um, in your packets, uh, it were there was a draft of the uh, request uh, for proposals. Uh, mm -hmm. Really, at this point, we don't necessarily need a vote from the board. Um, I think you know we could release it since the board has already voted to match the funds uh, for fifty percent match. Really, the uh, the idea was to share the request for proposals with the board, and if there are any objections, um, we can then discuss it and, and you know, create any change that's necessary. Okay. Uh, I did have one one item to share with the board that I did notice in the in the request and, and Mark maybe Mark Kelly could speak to this, but I did notice that the request refers to the hall as the East Valley Hall. Um, but the hall is actually named the East Randolph Hall. Well, of course, it's the East Valley Community Group that started all this. So there's a certain amount of uh, uh, just the idea that, that it, it does belong to the entire East Valley, not simply to East Randolph. Um, you know, it's been used that way forever. But it actually is is uh, for the entire region. It's one of the few places where a public meeting can easily be had. Uh, so uh, the the words East Valley are our preferred words, but we're not wedded to them. I, I I mostly say this in jest, but I would I would I would I would agree if our neighboring towns in the East Valley would contribute towards the operations of the hall, <laughs> as opposed to the rain like only. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
presumably they will pay fees to uh, to use the hall in the future. So. Uh, uh, thank you, Mark. So uh, yeah, if, if there are no objections, um, you know, uh, Trini and I could continue to work with the East Valley Community Group, um, and then at some point in the very near future, release the request for proposal. Can you give me a little bit of uh, idea how the the rest of this rollout will work? Uh, the, you mean the bid process? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so typically, what what happens is we create a either request for proposals or a request for bids, uh, really depending on the project that, that itself. Uh, and in the request, uh, we include you know the scope. We also re uh, include what we're um, implementing in terms of timelines and uh, the timelines tend to coincide with uh, select board meetings. So if um, the request for bids or proposals is, is sent out within the next uh, you know, few days, uh, what we would do is we would set a timeline for uh, a deadline for questions for any architect firm or architect to submit questions. Uh, following that, we would submit a, or create also a deadline for any addenda that we would add to or any changes to the RFP or RFP. And then following that, we would also include a deadline for the submission process for when the document is submitted. Uh, typically in, in non-COVID times, the, the bids are open in a public setting so that everyone who's submitting a bid writes down the amounts of, you know, that, that other firms are submitting as a bid. but uh, in current times, we, we either do them through Zoom or we just open the bids and then release the amounts to the bidders. Um, and once we have all of the bids in and we've had chance to review them as a staff, uh, we then pick typically the, the, the two lowest, but not always the two lowest bids. It really depends on the quality of work that's being proposed. And then the select board would review and approve of a bid. And uh, how how would the uh, how would it be advertised? I guess that's the point. Uh, the advertisement of bids is is guided by the purchasing policy and, and how we advertise projects. So we uh, post it on the website. We post it on uh, a state bidding site, and then we also post it uh, in the Herald for a local publication. I think that there may be other places that we may want to uh, post it. But yeah, once it's we'll, once it's out there, yeah, that. please, yeah, we 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 do welcome anyone to share it with everyone. Once it's once it's public, it it could be emailed, forwarded, advertised. I'm I'm just thinking of the Preservation Trust uh, as one outlet. Mm -hmm. All right, any other comments or questions on this topic? Okay, thanks Adolfo. He hearing no, no other comments, let's move on. Um, I'm delighted, one more comment. <laughs> Great, thanks Mark. Thank you. Um, we have um, a letter from uh, IUPE. Uh, yes, the town has received a letter from the International Union of Public Employees. Uh, that is the bargaining unit that uh, represents uh, town employees within the highway department, water, wastewater, uh, grounds crew, um, and formerly with the, uh, when we used to have around a police department as well. Uh, the union contract that we have in place at the moment is set to uh, expire mid next year. And so the union has sent us a letter uh, in advance of the expiration date to notify us that they would like to renegotiate the contract or negotiate a new contract. Um, so uh, we have the letter. Um, ideally what happens is uh, the town manager and a representative of the board and finance director uh, participate in the negotiate, uh, negotiating team uh, we could also hire a labor attorney to do it, but we did fairly well last negotiation two and a half years ago with just me, a member of the board and the finance director. So if there is a representative from the board that wish 
wishes to volunteer or, or two members of the board that wish to volunteer to serve on the, on the negotiating team, that would be ideal, but no more than three because these, uh, these negotiating sessions are not public. And if we have three board members, it would have to be a warned meeting. Right. Okay. We also don't have to decide tonight. It could, it could, it, you know, you could think about it and just let me know. Okay. That sounds good to me. I'm, I'm prepared to move on to the next item if, if there's no objections. Sounds fine. Okay. Sounds fine to me. <clears throat> um, so next next piece of business is the local hazard mitigation plan review. Uh, yes, the town per FEMA and the state is required to have in place a local hazard mitigation plan. It is a five-year plan that uh, essentially confirms to FEMA and confirms to the state that the town has adopted best practices for mitigating risk for, for mitigating um, potential issues uh, that arise after a, uh, an emergency. Uh, our plan is scheduled to expire uh, this year. So we participated in, in a state grant program where the state uh, issued the town a grant to update its local hazard mitigation plan. Uh, we partnered with Two Rivers Out of Quichi to update our plan. And we are now at a point where uh, we've submitted our plan as a first draft to Vermont Emergency Management. They have reviewed and provided comments. Um, the select board at this point, what we hope to, to expedite, what we hope the board to do is to approve the plan pending uh, the changes required by, by Vermont Emergency Management so that then once those changes are made, we can then submit to FEMA as a final plan. Okay, it sounds like you need a motion. Yes, please. So the motion you need would be to say to adopt the current plan with the condition of incorporating changes needed to ensure approval by VM, VEM. Yes, please. Yep. Okay, Thank you good. have it. Thank you, Perry. Second, I have a question. How come those changes aren't already in the plan? Uh, we received the changes very recently from VEM and our consultant, Two Rivers Out of uh, has not been able to incorporate the changes into the plan yet. Thank you. Sure. I have a motion. Uh, can we have a I second? That was a second. That was a second. Yeah, that was a second. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Motion passes 4-0. Next on our agenda is a proposal from the town listers. Yeah, the listers have submitted a proposal to the select board, mostly a, um, uh, a notice to the select board that they would like to restructure their existing K scale. Um, they are proposing a pay scale that would maintain their pay within the existing budget for the listers and the pay would increase. Uh, I don't have the form in front of me at the moment, but um, the pay would increase. Uh, Cliff, do you recall the amount of the increase? I, I have it in front of me. I have, in front I, have, of you? I have the form. It says they're, they're requesting that the town compensate the listers at a, a rate of $22 per hour. And if I'm not mistaken, the proposal will also decrease back to the normal wage once an assessor is, is hired <coughs> by the listers. And they have been actively searching for an assessor. Right. Okay, so you need a motion for that too? I don't believe we need a motion because it is the, the, the our listers are in the in independent. They're within the budget, right? Yeah, say within the budget. It's, it was more of a notification that they intend to do okay. this. They, so they wanted just to work together with the board. 
All right. Yeah. Well, that sounds fine to me. Yeah. Sounds yeah. good to me. Yeah. And me too. Adolfo, we, we, we saw this previously. What, why did it come up again? I, I don't recall. Uh, we, we received the previous notice the day before the, the morning of the select board meeting mm. uh, and Pat right. had brought it up yeah. as part yeah. of a discussion, yeah. but we could not, we could not have the board review it officially because there was insufficient time. Uh, and so I had I committed to the board at the last meeting to bring the, the issue to this meeting. Okay, great. All right. So if there's if there's no other questions or comments, we'll move on. Um, we'll move on to grants. First one is uh, the Let's Grow Kids grant. Uh, the Let's Go Kids grant is part of the part of a, an effort that Josh is really has really just taken the lead on and has worked with the community group and. Um, I believe Mary, who's on the call, has also been been involved. Um, the grant has already uh, been issued to the town. This is a, a grant that the select board had authorized the town to apply for. Uh, the grant amount was increased to the amount that it is now from the original amount that we thought we would receive. So now we would just uh, ask the select board to authorize us to accept the 50 58,000, I believe it is. Josh, do you, do you have the specific amount? It is 58,000. 58,000. Yes. Yep. And what's the purpose of this or the intent of this grant? This, this, so this grant is building off from the municipal planning grant that we received earlier this year from the state of Vermont. Um, to, um, to who then piggybacked off from the child care task force work. Um, so specifically the Let's Grow Kids grant um, is now focused on looking at um, the VTC Enterprise Center, um, the upper building of that parcel mm -hmm. um, and redeveloping that into a child care center. And so the $58,000 would be used um, to carry over the consultant that we use for the municipal planning grant, Reva Murphy, uh, former deputy commissioner of uh, child family services for the mm -hmm. state. Um, and she would be coming on as the project uh, coordinator and um, walking us through the, the process. Um, and then some of the work would also be uh, design and architecture. Um, work that will be done on, uh, on that location. Um, and, and work is already underway um, about, about sort of looking at the blueprints and, and uh, schematics. And obviously the town is working with Green Mountain Economic, Economic Development Corporation and the, and the task force in this process. Okay, thank you. Things, things are looking really good uh, for that project um, to potentially have a you know, much larger and necessary and needed childcare facility off, off the highway. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to move that we accept the Let's Grow Kids grant. I'll second that. Having a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, sound, was there a I only heard two uh, people. Pat, did you? You said I. You did. Okay. I, I, yeah. I saw his mouth. The mo <laughs> motion passes. <laughs> motion passes four zero, and we will move on to the VTrans Municipal Highway Stormwater Mitigation Grant. Uh, we were, we are the recipients, or we were issued uh, a notice indicating that we had been awarded a thirty-two thousand dollar grant for um, uh, engineering work or the issue that's developed on North Randolph Road. Um, we would like to ask the board to accept the grant so that once the grant has been uh, processed and we have a grant agreement, we could then work on a request for bids uh, for an engineering firm to evaluate uh, what is needed to repair North Randolph Road. Is it anticipated that that costs our 20% 
will cover that cost? Yes, for the engineering work, yes. And the grant is strictly for engineering uh, only. Yeah. Okay. We, so, Paul, you, you, this is just for our information. You don't need a motion, do you? Uh, we do need a motion to accept the grant. Oh, okay. This is to accept the grant. Okay. Yes, I didn't realize that. I'll move to accept the grant. I'll second. We have a motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes four zero. Could I ask? Could I ask what the time <coughs> looks like? If people ask, what are we looking at in terms of getting this done? I do. Sorry, Pat. I, I couldn't hear. The question. I'm sorry too. I um. What are we looking at in time frame in terms of to do this with with the grant and then to actually get the project done? Uh, that, that, it has been a challenge. We uh, attempted to try to resolve the issue earlier in the year. Um, the, the obstacle that we came across was from the Agency of Natural Resources. They said that they would not permit the work um, necessary at North Randolph Road until we had performed uh, this engineering study um, so the engineering study really would depend on what the engineering firm you know, sets for a timeline with our recommendations. Um, the challenge is that several alternatives have to be um, investigated, one of which per A and R is to potentially abandon North Randolph Road because of its location and you know, the potential damage and the work necessary uh, to repair it. So it really would require I, I, you know, I'm going out on a limb and say several months because each one of these alternatives will require a considerable amount of time, plus public uh, input sessions from the community to see how they feel about the alternatives. Um, so we're probably looking at springtime um, before before this type of review is conduct, you know, finished, um, and that's kind of. That's on the hopeful side because we haven't even received the grant agreement yet that allows us to start using uh, or even advertise the project as, as being funded. So springtime and that's wishful thinking. Yep. So the whole thing is a long term project. Very long term project. Yeah. Potentially very costly. <laughs> um. If there's no other comments or questions, we'll move on to old business. First item is appointments, and we're going to um, look at the Economic Development Committee first. Yes, a part of your uh, in your packets, there was the action item sheet of a request that has been made by the Economic Development uh, Council. One of those requests uh, includes the removal of a current member, and the second request is the appointment of a new member. And we have the chair in this meeting. So the reason I'm asking uh, for this change is because um, the as person that I'm asking to be removed since our last conversation had only ha um, attended one economic council meeting. So the attendance is poor. And I think it's time that um, we replace that person and with the person I have spoken to, and uh, she's willing to take on the responsibilities. And as far as the person to remove, they're more than welcome to uh, attend meetings as a guest, um, but they have not really contributed to any of the activities of the council um, as of date. Um. Mary, can you speak a little bit about um, Sarah Jackson and just since we don't have a statement from her, just kind of give us a little bit more background on her. Sure. So Sarah Jackson, I worked with um, on the R3 uh, Economic Development uh, Task Force, and she and I worked with Damien on putting together the business survey that was presented. I believe in April of 
2019, maybe I, I can't remember the date anyway. Um, and that was from a SWOT analysis where I gathered all of the data uh, from the local businesses and put it into an Excel spreadsheet. And then Sarah did the narrative and um, then told, asked me you know, to do the graphs and uh, pie charts and whatever else uh, that was incorporated into the book that we distributed to the community. Mm -hmm. um, she's also the executive uh, director on vital communities. She just uh, had ah. gone into that position. And I think mm -hmm. it's a great opportunity to have someone uh, from that organization to work and participate on the Economic Council. And uh, there was some concern whether there was a conflict of interest, but she, I sent her all the information regard, regarding the council. And as of yesterday, she said that their board said there was no conflict of interest and that um, she was free to join if, as long as the uh, select board uh, approves the appointment. Okay. I, I think that's a great organization for us to have that connection with. And I'm glad that, um, that her board sees it that way. I agree. And again, Sarah and I have worked very closely together uh, with past initiatives and she has been attending the economic council meeting. And uh, I think she would be a valuable person on, on the council. Mm -hmm. Right. I would uh, move that we add Sarah to the Economic Development Committee. And uh, do we also need to uh, include in that motion um, CJ Stump stepping off for? I'd rather do that separately. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll if, I, if I, well, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm, I, go ahead. No. I uh, just, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if the committee is already at max capacity or uh, max membership. If, yes, they are at, we are at the max capacity. Okay, so the board would not be, I'm sorry to uh, ask for a change, but the board would not be able to appoint a new member until we remove a member. Sure. Yeah, this raises my concern of before with, with the same person, actually, I think, where we don't have any policy as to how to remove somebody, which we should have. If somebody's missed a certain number of meetings or something, it seems like that's fair to the volunteer to um, know what the guidelines are. And I guess, I guess Mary has been trying since then to get in touch with her, so, um, but, Seems like there should be a town policy that when you're removing somebody, how and why you do that. In addition, Pat, and also um, I had, uh, I've sent out the minutes and um, CJ had sent me an email because she said she went to the town site, read it, and that she would be in attendance on the November 2nd meeting, but she was not. Yeah, I'm not arguing the case on this person i'm just saying the town should have a policy in general so that i can yeah i agree there, there should be some so, guidelines i i thought so maybe we don't have a policy for committees but i thought we for sure we had a policy for planning commissions and drb positions because i know that when i served in the planning commission we did remove somebody from the planning commission for not attendance my understanding is that the committees um come up with their own rules for so maybe that's where this fits in. Yeah, yeah. I, having formerly served on on the economic development committee, I can, I can um, speak to the fact that this individual's attendance has been a long-standing issue. issue. Uh, so, um, as the liaison to that committee, I can assure you that you're correct about that. <laughs> so. So it sounds like um, perhaps the discussion of um, of whether the town ought to have a town wide policy governing the, the removal of members from committees and commissions is, is something that is a separate conversation that we ought to have. I think I would agree. I would agree. Yeah. Um, the only a, a sort of aside being that we we might not have. Um, 
commissions are, are, are my understanding are, are by state statute. And so we might not even have authority to control that, but so we should look into that. I have a question. So if, if we're unable to make the change at this time and the term is up um, and I don't know what, what her expiration term is, I, I haven't gone out to look at it recently. Um, at that time in, I guess, March, would, uh, if her term is up and or time for a change, would that be at that time? Or, or is that something you folks will discuss amongst yourselves? And then let me know what I need to do uh, on my end. Well, I, point, I, I, me I, if I'm wrong, but didn't, didn't we um, some time ago, and it might have even been within my nine month tenure on the on the select board, didn't we say that all committee appointments were going to be renewable annually from well, now I, on? I, I, th I think right now the what we really need to focus on is is this particular position, and I yeah. the, the 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 board right now has the authority to remove a member and appoint a new one. So right, right. I, I, I would suggest that I would entertain a motion that we do the removal and appointment now and move on. Larry, I'll okay. make that motion that we remove CJ and we add Sarah Jackson. I'll second that. I've heard a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 4 0. And then we'll move on to. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, we'll move Mary. on to an to appointment to the Water Wastewater Committee. Yes, in your packets, you uh, also have um, a request from the Water Wastewater Committee to appoint Mariah Dekenga. Uh, and Mariah is on the call. Uh, and in your packet, you have a statement of interest from Mariah. Does anyone have questions for Mariah? Um, Mariah, do you have any background in this particular field? I do not have any backgrounds, no. But I'm very interested in learning. Okay. If I may also add with the board, uh, we have had um, historically a hard time filling positions with the Water Wastewater Committee. And we recently did have uh, someone resign from the committee who was the most recently appointed person to the committee. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and as I'm the chair of that committee, and <clears throat> we recently had a meeting that we couldn't get a quorum for. And so it's, it's really important that we um, try and get a full slate of folks on this committee so that we can do our business. Larry, I'll move that we add Mariah to the Water and Sewer Committee. Um, and just to comment on that, based on the fact we need somebody there watching what Larry's doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. Thanks for joining the committee, Mariah. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to working with you. Um, what's next? Sign ordinance approval. The select board had previously reviewed the sign ordinance that had been created uh, or updated by the planning commission um, and the select board's previous conversation regarding the sign, the updated sign ordinance. Uh, it was. Uh, uh, rather robust conversation about the banner uh, located uh, over Main Street. Um, so during my um, conversations with uh, folks in Burlington that do manage the, the banner signs in Burlington um, at several different locations, we found that um, even they had not fully looked at the, the legal part of it and were just kind of advertising banners as, as normal. So um, we have posted the sign ordinance. Uh, it has been posted uh, for almost two months now. So anyone interested um, has had an opportunity to review it. And at this point, um, 
if the select board were to vote to approve it, um, we could we could move forward with the new sign ordinance. I could also add that the planning commission spent a considerable amount of time uh, updating the process mm -hmm. and, and checking with legal sources and performing their due diligence. Yes, we did. Waiting for a motion. Well, I'm not on the committee that puts it together, so you guys got to do that. Fair enough. Uh, I will move that we approve the new sign ordinance. I will second that. We have a motion and a second. All in favor of approving the sign ordinance say aye. 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 Motion passes 4 0. Thank we'll move you. on to the town meeting and town report. Yes, this is a section just to follow up on the statutory requirements for town meeting and um, some of the deadlines that uh, we have internally for the town report. Um, Emery is managing or writing herd on this project um, this year. And uh, Emery, if you have any, any information to share with the board, this would be a good time. Yeah, hi. Right. So there are two things, uh, the easiest being that someone, um, you can choose who, you can all fight for it, but you need to uh, write the narrative for the select board uh, section of the town report. Uh, please get it to me sometime before December 9th. It can be oh, a group effort. It can be. We'll give that to Trini. She's not here. She's <laughs> <Perfect. laughs> got the glory to me, so. You're gonna love All right. It. <laughs> I, I'm happy to help Trini wordsmith it, um, but <laughs> since she's not here, we we can hand that. You know, be careful when you don't show up. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. The second one is. Um, you all, all need to decide when you want to have your meeting for town meeting day. I believe last year you all decided to do it the Saturday before instead of town meeting to allow other people to come. So you don't necessarily have to decide tonight or right now, but that's something to discuss. I, I would like to raise that's one a... issue with relation to that. And I've become aware of a number of communities around the state that are because of covid and it's anticipating that it's going to continue well into possibly the spring of next year um, i know that pomfret at its last select board meeting uh, elected to um, hold its entire town meeting by australian ballot and apparently that is part of a trend that's happening with smaller communities around the state so that might need to be something that we have to consider as far as the date for town meeting goes that was done by the voters so the voters yeah, chose right. to do it the day before yeah yeah i mean as far as altering something for australian ballot that, that might be another conversation um to be had once i i'd like to hear a little more information about how that fits the statute yeah, I believe the I actually have some information on it that uh, that uh, the editors at the Wood, at the Vermont Standard with for which I've been writing forwarded to me today. Um, uh, but I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. I would have to review the motion made uh, I believe now it's almost two two town meetings ago. Yeah, I believe the motion was just to have one town meeting, which was this year this calendar year's town meeting on sat the saturday before town meeting to see okay. how it would work um leaving leaving the option open for the board to then choose whether or not it wanted to keep it on saturday or on town meeting day but um you know after speaking with staff we found that the attendance levels remained the same it was just different people so it didn't really encourage or didn't really increase the, the number of attendees, which was the purpose for changing it to the Saturday. Right. I think we had one of the things we had discussed was, was the potential of keeping it at Saturday for more than one year to sort of give people a chance to kind of wrap their minds around the change in date and then yeah. 
know, yeah. give it more of a chance to, before we go to changing it back. Sure. The wording on the, the wording on the article was was um, was vague enough, so it wasn't specific for one year. It just says, "Shall the town voters agree to change the day of town meeting from the first Tuesday in March to the first Saturday immediately preceding town meeting day?" And they that voted to approve that. So to me, it seems like that means the town meeting is on Saturday. It certainly does sound like I, that. Um, I think yeah. it give, I think it leaves it up to the select board to kind of bounce it around. I think well, the voters okay. authorize the move, uh, but it would be up to the board to decide. Well, this year or Saturday or next year, you know. I, okay, well, to Larry's you, point, you don't you want dig to dig into that around. for me. Yeah. You, but I agree with Perry. Okay. Now, Emery, just out of curiosity, when did we have to? When is it required to set that date? When would we need to do that? Mm. Let me check the list here. We have to warn the. We have to uh, put the the ballot out. I believe it's within forty five days of town meeting. So right. we have up until forty five days. Uh, I'd have to confirm with with Joyce or clerk, but I believe it's up to the forty five days before the meeting before we have to post the warrant, and the warrant has to include the location and the date of town meeting. Right, and, and then you also. So with that, you also need to be able, anybody who's looking for special appropriations and those things need to be in, and that's why they have to be in by near the last week of January. Yeah. 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 My notes say 40 days before elections. Okay. 40 days, yeah. It is 40. We went through that with the last uh, town meeting with the vote on the surpluses. That's right. Yeah. All right. And we'll also need to decide at some point if we want to be mailing a ballot out for town meeting, correct? Yes, that could be something the board could, could discuss. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also in, in terms of um, making all of town meeting by, by Australian ballot, I mean, we're, we're pretty close to that now. Um, there's very, there's very little which is actually decided from the floor. So it'll be interesting to see what, what, we, what it would entail to move those few items to Australian ballot. Yeah. The only thing that comes to mind is the appointment of the budget committee, which I don't know why that is, but that's something that seems to always occur at town meeting, which is not on Australian ballot. Right. I don't know why that is. I think that's how it was worded back in 94 or 1996, somewhere around there. <laughs> I, yeah, I, things from the past come back to haunt us. Yeah, mm -hmm, absolutely. Well, part monetary issues that are voted by Australian ballot, that was the vote. And everything else like policy issues remain on the floor. Yeah, I, I, um, you know, I think what, what Tom had mentioned, I, I, I think at some point between now and town meeting, the legislature may create changes that uh, will allow towns to make it easier to have town meeting either virtually or through entire Australian ballot. I, you know, I think there are additional measures being taken this week and next week to reduce the number of people gathering together. And to Tom's point, you know, we're we're barely going to be getting out of winter at that point, and I don't I don't see things easing up anytime soon. So, mm -hmm. right. You well, know. oh, there's a little bit of work for you early in January, Larry. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> yeah, fix that one, please. <laughs> I think yeah, Emory also first, had one other request for the bill. board um, to potentially either start considering or. Uh, we really just start start considering a person to dedicate uh, dedicate this year's town report to, as has been the tradition. Okay. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. And when would you need that decision by? Uh, just before you go to press with the annual report, correct? Certainly, a little bit before then would be fine, but yeah. Yeah, the copies are going 
to the printer in January for the 31st. Okay. We'll need it in time to decide on somebody and also write up a little blurb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When are we going to decide that? Uh, we, there, there are roughly two meetings remaining, at least two official regular select board meetings. Uh, and in between there will likely be uh, sprinkled special meetings with um, the special meetings that have been held. So there, there will be at least two or three opportunities for the board to, um, you know, to talk about options that uh, they may have, they, individual members may, may have in mind. Well, maybe what we should do is submit our thoughts to you, Adolfo. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that could work. And then I can Comply share a little future meeting. Yeah. If anybody's got a little list or anybody they'd like to nominate, maybe we just shoot those names off to Adolfo and then you could put it together in the next meeting. It's a good idea. And I could share it with everyone. Yeah. Absolutely. Sounds good. Okay. Anything else under town meeting and town report? Not for me. Okay. Well, if there's no other comments or questions, we'll move on to other business. And I know we, we added something under other business, but I do not recall what it was. Uh, added uh, the purchasing policy under old business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, under old business, of course, yeah. of course. Okay. Well, let's continue with old business then. Uh, so the in your packets, uh, not in your packets, but as a as a supplemental email, uh, you receive the updated purchasing policy that includes the changes that uh, that the board had requested to be made. Um, uh, Cliff has been working really hard on the purchasing policy as well as uh, other policies that his department is working to, to improve. And so um, if the board uh, likes the changes that have been added, uh, and those are the changes that the board requested to be added to the purchasing policy, then um, at this point, uh, if there are no questions, um, you know, just the motion to accept the purchasing policy as updated. So I'm assuming, Cliff, you just took our notes and fixed this, and there's really no other striking changes that we are not aware of? Uh, that is correct. I, the substantive changes from the last uh, draft that you looked at was um, moving the threshold required for a purchasing purchase order up to $1,000 mm -hmm. and right. moving the other thresholds. The, the one threshold that didn't move was the um, the ten thousand dollar threshold where um, it has to go off for a bid? Yeah, two quotes or something. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I'd make a motion to approve the uh, purchasing policy that's been submitted. And I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the purchasing policy. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes four zero. Okay, do we have any other business? Um, I just have a question and I'm not sure it, it may belong under old business, but I just wonder if um, given the, the, the report that was in the Herald maybe two, three issues ago now relative to the East Randolph Baptist Church and the potential uh, purchase of the Bethel Boy Scout camp, um, it seemed like there's some reticence on the part of some of the church leadership now as to whether to go through with that. And I just wondered if we've heard any more from them uh, since that report in the paper two weeks ago, um, which, by the way, also said that um, the church leadership um, may have some concerns about um the use of the property if they do purchase it uh use of it by groups whose philosophies or purposes might be antithetical to some of the church's philosophies and teachings and i just i didn't know if we've heard any more um since that article appeared in the herald or not uh nothing has come into the town um other than just the decision by the by the East uh, Randolph Baptist Church to choose to not accept the property. Um, or well, they haven't really formally, have they formally notified us that they're not going to accept it? Uh, to or? me through email, yes, they have. Yes. They have? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, that's okay. what I was, that's more or less what I was asking because the article in the Herald just indicated they were still mulling it over, but it sounds like they've stopped mulling and decided. So, so we're back to square one on that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I have some thoughts and a suggestion about it, but perhaps it would be better, uh, more appropriate for next month's meeting. Um, yeah, I, I would agree, Tom, mostly because it's not a worn topic. Exactly, um, right. exactly, you know, I totally get it. I totally get it. But I'd love to hear it, so can we put it on the agenda for next month? Yeah, yeah. Sure. I actually, actually have two thoughts about it, but um, uh, let's, let's put it on the agenda. And, uh, I'm happy to pursue some alternatives if if we agree if we all agree that it's worth pursuing. So, Great. Adolfo, do we have any other business? Uh, no, no other business. Okay, manager's report. Uh, just uh... I was muted. Can I do another business? Go ahead, Pat. I'm sorry, I didn't, I thought, <laughs> thought I was unmuted, but I wasn't. Um, when I was counting ballots election night, the town ballots, there were several comments on the ballots about Fish Hill Road. They agreed with the transfers, but they'd like to have Fish Hill Road fixed. I, I don't know if anybody's been up there lately, but I'm wondering what's happening there, Adolfo. And did uh, we, we have received, uh... We finally received estimates from uh, two or three potential bidders, uh, and I won't say bidders, but estimates given to the highway department. Uh, just the basic shim, which is really just like a five to, probably a five to seven year coating on top, um, is upwards of sixty to eighty thousand dollars, depending on the, on the uh, contractor. Um, so the challenge is, you know, we're facing issues with North Randolph Road. We're facing other issues with Stock Farm Road, with the river meandering and potentially endangering that, that project. Um, and that's not to say that uh, Fish Hill Road is, isn't, isn't a challenge, but we also have other challenges. So um, at some point, you know, we could make a recommendation of the select board and it really would follow the board on what to fix and I'm pretty sure that, you know, if we do leapfrog some of the roads, say for example, School Street, uh, which is equally in, in need of repair, we would have to have a reason why one road is picked over another. And if it's more the squeaky wheel syndrome. Um, so I, you know, I could share with the select board the bids that we receive or the estimates that we receive. Um, and then I would invite our highway superintendent to come in and share with the board Know, from his perspective, which roads, which of the roads is in dire need and which is just more of a, it doesn't look pretty. Um, so I, I could share more information with the board during the next meeting with, with the cost estimates. I would like that. Sure. Does, all, does Fish Hill just need a shim coat or does it need something more than that, actually? Uh, it probably would need a lot more than just the you know, the, the, the basic covering. Um, that's also the challenge is weighing the option of, do we spend 60 to 80,000 on just the basic knowing that within the next eight years, it's gonna require a much bigger uh, type of repair. Uh, I'm not an expert in that type of work, which is why I'm, I'm encouraging the board to really uh, take the advice of our highway superintendent and he could give more of an expert opinion on it. Did we get a petition about Fish Hill Road? I never saw one. Uh, one was brought to town hall over the summer. Yeah. Oh, and sure. the petition was that, uh, I wouldn't say over the summer, I would say, Perry, wow. what would you say, August? Oh, yeah. It was in August. August, yeah. yeah. And the petition was called for, yeah, the petition called for the road to be repaved by the end of this construction season. and. You know, I spoke with some members of the community and I understood that they were very, you know, passionate about the repair, but I explained to them that the town just doesn't pave a road without having had a plan within a, a month or two month period. Um, it is a, it's a long process because it's a costly project. Um, the residents 
were very passionate about the road. So, you know, it, I would be lying if I said they understood. I think they understood. I don't think they agreed. Sure. But I could bring all that information uh, to the next meeting. It is pretty bad. I would like uh, I would like to have him come to the meeting. Sure, invite him. I'd agree with that because, like I said, I'm got numerous phone calls about that road. So yeah, I get it that some of these other ones are also in needing of repair, but I'm not sure that we should continue to put this one off. Sure. I'd love to hear from the town road crew foreman. Okay. Do we have any in um, manager support? Uh, some of it was official road and some of it was to discuss that um, Cliff and I have been talking about um, pulling together a more long-term paving plan uh, that would require the highway superintendent to really grade roads, not the physical grading, but like issue a grade. Mm -hmm. um, and potentially have a grade of anywhere from one to 10 with 10 needing to be great, you know, repaired ASAP. Uh, and one, it can wait every, you know, every couple of years. So um, that's, that's potentially in the works and um, that's it for this week. Okay. I know that in, in, in some cases it did actually, even if a road is in terrible shape from a priority point of view, it can, Makes sense to to do work on a road which is in better shape prior to it because the road that's in terrible shape was going to be need to be completely rebuilt anyway. Whereas if you let a road that might not be in such bad shape go any further, it might require even more money um, in the long run. So it, it ends up being more cost effective overall. Um, to do some repairs sometimes on roads, which might not seem like they needed as much um, to, to, to gain those efficiencies over a long period of time. And we, Adolfo, we'd be looking at a plan which would be considered of those sorts of, um, what's the word, um, occurrences, you know, the way, the way the roads are actually are and that sort of, that sort of scale. Uh, yes, it would be an all encompassing plan. So, and Larry's right. Um, for example, whenever you see a road on the actual asphalt surface, by that point, the damage has been occurring for years during the sub road base. So, um, you know, it, 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 that's how the problems start typical with potholes. They don't start at the top, they start at the bottom and then they work their way up to the asphalt portion of it. So, um, yes, the potential plan is going to be more than just the visual site, um, the visual inspection that will also include if cracks are starting to develop on the, on the surface of the road, and if they are developing, um, and how, uh, how close of a proximity are the cracks to each other, and if there are many, then that's, that's a sign of more of a systemic problem, but um, yeah, to Larry's point, it's, it's less costly to repair a a small problem right away than it would be to wait for the road to continue to be deteriorated uh, because then it's more than just the surface repair, it's the sub base repair as well. And Adolfo, do we have the expertise in house to make these assessments? Uh, I, you know, I, I couldn't say, um, you know, our crew is, have had years and years and years of experience, but you know, sometimes these type of issues do require um, uh, trained engineer eye. And that's not to say that 10, 20 years of experience um, doesn't give somebody that, that eye to be able to determine um, what it is. But, um, you know, I, I couldn't say for certain if our crew um, has that, that perspective or has that ability. We're going to base that much money, spending that much money on a plan. We should make sure we have the right input into the plan. Well, no, um, I'm sorry if I gave that that impression earlier. You know, the plan itself isn't going to cost us any money, uh, other than staff time. You know, that's a plan that I would work with 
cliff and with uh, highway and we could incorporate VTrans into the plan. So that that's just staff um, you know, doing its job. No, I meant, I meant carrying out the plan and maybe doing the wrong things first. Yeah, I think that I think maybe what that what you what you maybe have heard was the, the cost of repairing Fishhill Road, the the cost estimate, which is sixty eighty eighty thousand dollars, and that's not to fully repair it. That's just a um, like a, a basic, very one or two inch coat at the very top of it. Yeah. Right. And my point was, if you're going to have a plan that's going to spend as much money as we need to do on our roads in the next five or 10 years, we should make sure it's based on as knowledge as possible. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and I could work with VTrans to see if, uh, or with uh, the state funding agency to see if a, if a municipal planning grant is something that can be used for this type of plan. And then if it is, then we could potentially hire an engineering firm or a consultant to pull the plan together based on uh, direct expertise uh, on the subject matter. It's a good I idea. I have more, more of this information to share with the board for the next meeting when I have, um, when I can share with everybody the cost estimates and the petition and everything else in a meeting packet. Or possibly VTrans has money because you'd think they'd really support that. Yeah. All right. So if that's the end of the manager's report, um, I believe we're done with the regular meeting as well. Uh, yes, yeah, the only thing remaining is an executive session.